Man, we're glad you're listening from wherever you are listening from. And today, we are going to deal with one of the more controversial topics in the book of James. One of the most debated, if you will, passages in most of the book. We're going to talk today about miracles and prayer and divine healing and faith and why God doesn't do it sometimes, or what went wrong, or what we should have done differently. And I just felt the Lord give me a word that is extremely strategic in addressing all of these topics, and that is the message for today. Here is the title of today's sermon. Now that's a miracle. Let's read it. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Like, go ahead. When you're suffering, seek the face of God. Call out to your heavenly Father. This passage made me think, I think Christians are better at complaining than they are calling out to God, and that's not a good place to be. Come on, somebody. We need to get better at crying out to God because that's the only thing that's going to actually make a difference. We can complain all day long and nothing's going to change, but when somebody gets on a knee and starts crying out to God, there's so many of y'all in here today, I'm overexcited about the sermon that I came to preach. When a Christian cries out to God, when a son or a daughter cry out to God, it makes a difference. Complaining, a sin, no difference. Crying out to God, seek his face and watch him move. Is anyone cheerful? Great. You're not going through anything right now. You better be praising him. Come on, you better be thanking him for what you're not going through. You better be thanking him for what he's already brought you through. Don't wait until devastation to become desperate. Come on, somebody. Don't wait until you enter into the the distress to begin to become desperate for the divine. You need to go after God when nothing's going wrong. You need to go after God when everything's going wrong. Come on. Seek the Lord with all of your heart all of the time. Don't wait until it's falling apart. Verse 14 gonna hurt myself today is anyone among you sick let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him or her anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus I believe would be fitting right there anointing him with oil listen there's nothing supernatural about the oil that we use in fact I think we have a little bit of Jerusalem oil that we have left. Somebody ordered it um, through this very anointed company called Amazon. (laughs) Come on, praise God for two-day shipping. We don't have any oil left. Look it up and get it here by Sunday. Bless the Lord. And uh, that stuff's expensive, so your cheap pastor found that a bottle of olive oil actually makes the expensive oil go a little bit further. There's nothing special about the oil except for what, who the oil represents. See, in Scripture, we pray to Jesus and we anoint with Holy Spirit. He's not the Holy Spirit. He's the person. He is Holy Spirit. That's his name. And the oil represents Holy Spirit. So that's why we do that every Sunday. Now, everybody doesn't take advantage of it because you'd rather carry your illness than get out of your comfort zone. But that's a message I'm going to talk about here in a little later. We're supposed to do that. That's why we do it. Simply because... That's what God's Word tells us to do. Hey, there are some times you don't have to understand, but you have to obey. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 15, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Save? Hang on. Let's keep reading. And the Lord will raise him up Like from the dead physically? Yeah, sure, that's what we're talking about, right? 
And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And I thought we were talking about physical, divine, earthly healing. I thought that's what this passage was about. Let's keep reading. Verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Natural or supernatural? Physical or spiritual? Does God separate the two? And the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now, the way that I memorized this, I think it was King James, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And I've heard a lot of messages preached just on that one verse. And a lot of them I agreed with and I even appreciated. They were very inspirational in that moment. But I believe this is one of the best translations of this verse. That the prayer of a righteous person, and you got to understand that you are not righteous unless you're in Christ. But he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So whenever you confess Jesus as Lord of your life, you become righteous and your prayers begin to make a difference. Come on, somebody. When you pray in the name of Jesus because you put on the Lord Jesus and the righteous prayer begins to offer up prayers the Lord hears the prayer he looks down and sees the son covering the new child the born again believer and that prayer starts working it didn't just work and you don't have to feel it you don't even have to sense anything I love it when people tell, no, I was praying, and I got so weak in my knees, I just hit the floor. Cool. And I've had other people come to me like, man, I, I really felt like I was praying to God, and nothing happened. Okay. Who cares? Pastor, they laid hands on me, and I didn't fall down. Well, good for you. <laughs> Pastor, they laid hands on me, and I, I flew back three pews. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Hope your landing was okay. Come on, <laughs> Hope the Holy Ghost caught you on the way. I got to tell you a funny story. We were singing a song in Arkansas. I didn't share this in first service. I didn't have time because I wanted to get to Pastor Weston because he wants to tell us about what happened, took place in Tanzania. We were singing this song. Oil, anointing. That was it. You the, fall on me, anointing. And we sang that thing 52 times. I think we were going to sing it until somebody ran. So I started praying that somebody would run. Because I was ready to go to the next song. Like, I couldn't even remember the song. That's how unmeaningful it was in that moment. I was, I was just struggling with this. I love the song because I, I got a little old school in me. But finally, man, somebody took off. Some of y'all heard this story. Somebody took off from the balcony. All right, if you're going to run, don't do it from up top. Come on, that's... That's not the place you want to come from. You don't want to come down. You want to go up. Come on, you know what I'm saying? But he came down. Well, his feet got ahead of him. This was not a person that I would look at and go, you know, I bet they're a runner. <laughs> it's more of a waddler. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't really, I'm sorry, anyways. They came down, and they, got, they weren't real athletic. And the Holy Ghost, when they got to the bottom, the Holy Ghost tripped them. <laughs> and then they did the Superman. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes, look, I don't care if you feel anything or not. You don't have to feel anything in order for God's Word to do what God's Word said it would do. You don't have to know whether it's working or not. The Word just works. All right, there's two sides of this coin. And I watched myself, and I actually did it in less than two minutes in first service. There is this confessionalist side. It's when you think you can just confess everything in the place like when you fast and pray and you're trying to force God's hand you can just confess God to do whatever you want him to do that's very dangerous territory you may have heard it like believe it receive it blab it and grab it come on somebody if you say it if you have enough faith if you've got if you're willing to sow your seed of a thousand dollars today you've heard that side of that story that's confessionalism okay on the other end of the spectrum is cessationism and I've actually had people preach against me and what I believe. Because I do believe that life and death lie in the power of the tongue. And I do believe in the law of sowing and reaping. But if we're not careful, we can make the gospel and the healing and the blessing and the favor of God self-centered. 
And ultimately, if we're not careful on the other end, see, people are always trying to get you to pick sides. But you come down to the other end, and if you're not careful, these people say, well, when the day of perfection came, the gifts were no longer needed, and the Bible says that these things shall cease. I don't know if you've been looking around, brother and sister, but there ain't a whole lot of perfection going on in society right now. The Lord didn't just come. He's coming back. We're standing in the gap in the day of the Lord. That's my personal interpretation of that passage. Nothing has ceased. See, we get stuck on this end because we don't know how to explain why God didn't do what we wanted him to do. And if you're not careful, just as you can make the word of God selfish, you can also make it powerless. So don't get stuck on either side. Come over here in the middle. Number one, if you're taking notes, sometimes, actually most of the time, God's ultimate answer to prayer is eternal life. It's not just a temporary, the answer to a temporary request. Church, sometimes God's answer to our prayer is heaven. That's the answer. And we know the scripture, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. You've heard this before. But, but he is the Lord our God. He, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts, in fact, ours are not even his. As high as the heavens are above the earth are his ways and his thoughts over ours. Right? We actually address this week one, number one in this series. We have to gain an eternal perspective, an eternal perspective outlook we have to recognize that we serve a God that sees from a perspective that we can not and sometimes I feel even better about what I do not know than I did once I found out what I thought I wanted to know you ever been in that scenario See, when I first got here, and we had a couple of hundred people in the first service the first couple of weeks, and then Megan dwindled that thing down to a hundred people because nobody wanted to be around her. <laughs> See, y'all laugh because y'all know that's ignorant. It was me that <laughs> dwindled that thing down. And we got that thing down to where we could manage it, you know? And call that a Gideon revival. <laughs> Got rid of all those people that didn't really want to be here. Some of them came back. But I had this handful of people, and I had to have this conversation multiple times. I had people that wanted to tell me things that I didn't know about people that I didn't know. And I had to have a conversation like, I don't want to know who those people have been and or what those people have done because I'm new. I just want to assume that everybody here wants to live for Jesus. That's not denial. That's divine. Come on, that's prophetic. I don't care who you were before I got here. Who you, here's who you're going to be now. Come on, somebody. I had somebody come up to me and tell me, Pastor, I don't know. You just need to know this. There is a spirit of offense on this church. And I said, well, I'm about to build a ladder. And there's going to be some people that get over a fence. They just gonna climb. And if you got the offense in you, see most of the time people blame a spirit when it's really something that they're dealing with personally, but I ain't got time to preach that message today. See, there are some, <laughs> there are some things you're honestly better off just discovering for yourself. You ever heard it? Now, mamas and grandmamas, y'all don't get this. Y'all want to help the kid learn everything before they make. Daddies, we get this. Hang on, hang on, girl, hang on a second. He gonna learn. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and we and we have to understand there are some things that we just don't need to know right now. And I even read through scripture. I'm like, God, I don't understand that. And I've had conversations with people that study scripture. Like, man, why do you think the Lord made it so hard to understand? Because He don't want us to know. Because he knows that we're not ready for what, he, what all he has. And I've had to learn. Y'all hone in with me for a second. People start going to sleep when I don't make them laugh or I'm not yelling. It's weird. I, it's, I have had to learn to trust God no matter what. 
I have had to learn, and I'm still learning, especially when things don't work out the way that I wanted them to, and I believed them to. That's what makes me so frustrated with this prosperity garbage, just as much as it makes me frustrated that these people would preach against God's willingness and ability to still perform signs, wonders, and miracles, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. I, I have just learned to trust God. Now, my personal story, in the, the one that has been the hardest thus far, and everybody has a difficult story, and many of you have one that is even more difficult than mine. But standing outside of my father's ICU room when he was connected to all of the machines and he was on life support and, and I had prayed and it was one of the first times I ever prayed in tongues in front of everybody because he hadn't had a heartbeat for an hour and God restored the heartbeat and then we were in the ICU for seven or eight days. Megan had taken a U-Haul up to Searcy, Arkansas and had other people there help her move all our stuff into the ministry house that we were going to be living in and I'm in Longview and I, I'm outside of the hospital room and I'm praying praying because I got a missionary Baptist family I'm not taking shots at missionary Baptist people my grandfather still is I love him but but most of my family on that side believe that the gifts and the healings and the miracles have ceased a lot of those people that I grew up with are cessationists in belief. They believe that God doesn't work that way. God doesn't use us that way. The apostles and the prophets, all those things passed away with those guys, and God doesn't do that. And so I was on the other side. It's crazy to me that all the cessationists call a Pentecostal when they need to see the power of God. Come on, somebody. They asked me and my uncle, the Pentecostals, to go back there. You need to go pray over your daddy. I was like, you need to pray over my daddy. We all need to pray. All right, anyway, so I'm outside the room praying over my daddy and I said God I know that you can I know that you are able I want you to reach into that room and you restore that brain I don't care what the doctor said you can make those brain waves come back you can make those synapses click again God you can perform the supernatural and I don't want to hear a cop out of you going to heal him in heaven and in that moment the Lord corrected me now I'm not really, I'm like you, I'm not really good at being corrected, period, but especially when I'm upset, and I'm really even worse at being corrected when I'm losing someone that I love, but God stepped through that, and he corrected me in that moment, and he said, hey, and it was very gentle, I sensed it, I didn't hear an audible voice, I just sensed this in my spirit, I heard the Lord say, Please don't call what I do in eternity a cop-out. Because anything that I do here is just temporary. But what I do there will reign forever. It's not a cop-out. Church, I learned in that moment, and I'm still learning, that it's not a cop-out to believe and to know that whatever happens, God is sovereign and he is worthy. And sometimes his answer to my faith-filled request. Here's how I know that God's will came to pass in that room. Because I was standing outside of that window and I turned around across the parking lot and I looked up the hill and I saw a church. And I said, God, please let that be an assembly of God church. Some people that I know will come in here and anoint with oil and pray over my daddy. And I walked up to the top of the hill and I don't know if the church was Episcopalian 25 seconds ago or if God just turned it, but I'll be if it wasn't an assembly of God church right there across the street from the ICU and I walked into that room and they were in worship rehearsal and I walked in and I sat down and I started crying in the back of the room while they were worshiping getting ready for Sunday and a group of men came over there and said hey are you okay and I looked up with tears in my they didn't know I was a credentialed minister going to be a youth pastor I looked up with tears in my eyes I said no I'm not okay all of those men came over to that hospital they anointed their hands with oil they began to pray over my daddy and my daddy opened his eyes and moved him around for a minute and then he went back to sleep and I said I think God's gonna heal him. and they said we think he is too so I know that between all of those guys that came to that room there was enough faith in that room for a miracle but after nine days I just had to trust God and I just had to know that sometimes 
Actually, most of the time, God's answer to my prayer is eternal. That's number one. But number two, God, He still heals. He still heals. I hadn't just heard about Him doing it. I've seen Him do it. I've heard firsthand from Assembly of God missionaries on the other side of the world and one of them was telling a story to our youth group about a little old lady that came up and she was hunched over and her arm was all curled up and he could see her bones squished up in her skin and she came up and began to ask for prayer and that missionary did what a lot of us do God I don't know what to pray and so he just anointed his hands with oil and he laid hands on the lady. He said, I didn't feel anything. I didn't sense anything. I didn't start levitating in the spirit. Michael and Gabriel didn't come down and lift up both arms and begin to shine the glory of God. I was just praying, standing there like I would anywhere or anybody else. And all of a sudden, those bones began to crack in that woman's arm. And she extended that arm. I've heard other stories of missionaries and evangelists and pastors and teachers firsthand. If you've never listened to R.W. Schambach, I don't like everything that he says because sometimes, again, if we're not careful, we can go to the wrong end of the spectrum. But he tells a story of one boy who received 26 miracles in a moment. I was at a basketball game in college. Some of you have heard this story. And a guy jumped up for the basketball. He had about a 42-inch vertical, and that's not an exaggeration. My man could jump out of the gym. When he came back down, somebody had cut his legs out from underneath him. He landed on his head. I heard his neck next snap 15 feet away from me they took him in an ambulance to the hospital I wasn't even hardly living for Jesus at this point I had made a fool of myself screaming but I, I just knew in my heart of hearts that I served a God who could and I served a God who would and so I went to the emergency room and I asked the head coach of the basketball team and who is by the way now the athletic director of a Christian school Calvary in Shreveport Louisiana I asked coach I said man can we pray over him and his team gathered around and I didn't know what to pray I didn't even know what I was doing I just knew who to ask and so we started started praying and that boy whose neck had just snapped and he had a 99% chance that he would never walk again as we were praying for him I will never forget this his toes started to wiggle while we were praying a year later he was back out on that basketball court and he was an all-american that he was better the next year than he was before I still serve a God who has the ability to reveal himself through supernatural healing we went through the series and we still believe that Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changed. I know one more miracle I want to share with you. I heard another pastor telling this story about his daddy. He had been praying against this cancer that had come up in his lymph nodes and then he had developed these knots in his face and he was going to have surgery on his face and the doctor said listen the nerve endings in his face are going to be damaged for the rest of his life it's going to take weeks if not months for this guy for him to be healed for him to be able to eat solid food for him to be able to smile again or respond or speak These are, this is going to be a very difficult a very invasive surgery you just need to understand that and they said Okay, we understand. He had the surgery. The pastor comes in to see his daddy, and the daddy is sitting up, eating breakfast, smiling and talking, finding out what all took place and what was going on. And the pastor called the doctor. He said, I thought you said this. My daddy wasn't going to be able to talk or eat or smile or, 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 or talk back to uh, converse with anybody, that it was going to take weeks for his nerve endings to heal, and there was no way that this was going to be an easy surgery. And the doctor said, he's not going to be able to. It's going to take a while. It's going to be tough and difficult for him. And the pastor said, well, somebody needs to come in here and tell him that. Because right now, he's doing this and doing that. And they declared that man a modern-day medical miracle. Two years later, he passed away from the same cancer. Fit that into your name and claim it. What do you do with that? Here's what I came to say today. Sometimes... God's answer to prayer is heaven. It's eternity. But God still heals. And we need to pray to the God of impossibilities. 
that he would do what only he can and only he is able to do. But then we need to abide in Christ no matter what he does. James chapter 5 verse 14, is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Guys, this is not denial. This is divine. This is what the Word of God says that we can and should do. That we take the time to believe God for the supernatural. And just for a second, and I just want to address this, and I'm going to come, I'm going to come way down, and I'm going to be as compassionate and sensitive to this as I can. But I want you to notice that that Bible, this is a biblical absolute for me. And I showed you on several occasions why God does or does not answer prayer. And it is only for his glory that he responds to our request. Okay, and then when we talked last week about his glory and only him receiving glory and only him getting the credit for the supernatural. Okay, this passage says when you anoint with oil, you do it in the name of of the Lord because only the Lord can save only the Lord can heal I'm going to lighten it up just a little bit but then I'm going to become serious again only the Lord can help you find your keys unless you have somebody with you that will help you in the name of the Lord find your keys guys Hear me, listen, I, I mean this as gently but as adamantly as the Word of God is in this passage. When we pray, we don't pray in any other name. I'm going to say it. Charlene Richard can't heal your loved one. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Some of you want to get up and walk out and never come back again. God help, God bless that sweet child who is probably in the kingdom of God, wondering why everybody keeps saying her name. The Bible says, we anoint with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when God moves in the supernatural, God gets the glory for the supernatural. You ask anything in my name and I will give it to you so that the Father may be glorified, not through anybody or anything else, but the Son who shed his blood and bore his stripes for the healing that we are requesting. I'm not trying to make anybody mad. I'm just telling you, there's some things in Scripture that don't line up with what some of us do. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's the second song I tried to sing in one sermon. That's dangerous. (laughs) I have decided, because I don't know why God does or does not. I have just decided that I have to trust what He says over what I see. Because sometimes his answer to prayer is heaven. But sometimes he wants to reveal himself through the supernatural. Listen to me. The healer has not closed shop. Well, that makes me want to preach about five minutes right there. Jehovah Rapha has not shut the door. He is still able and he is still willing You remember when the leper came up to Jesus and he said to the Son of God, if you will, if you can, and if you will, would you heal me? And Jesus said, I can and I will be healed. And the man left that place rejoicing because we don't just serve a God who used to. Come on, somebody. We just still serve a God who does what only he can do. And it's always, it's not always what I want. But it's always eternal. God is still in the business. Why does God sometimes answer prayer? Why does God sometimes move miraculously? Why does God sometimes heal physically? And sometimes he doesn't. I'm going to help you. I need you to write this down. I think this is important. You ready? 
I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Because I know that I have laid hands on people. I stood right over there. And there were people standing around me and behind me. And they confirmed this. And I laid hands on an individual who had been pronounced essentially only a certain amount of days left to live because of the cancer that was consuming the body. And I laid hands on that person. And as that person held their hands up, I'm telling you, I've never sensed the presence of God like I sensed the presence of God right over there. Or any more than. I've sensed Him several times. But any more than I did right over there. And I, thought, I started telling I'm telling you right now, God's going to heal. God's healing. And God did. Just not the way that I thought He was. And I have had moment after moment after moment where it's been that way. But hear me, listen, I have also had moment after moment after moment when I didn't know if God would, and he did it anyways. I've received phone calls on Sunday afternoons from people in this church that they had a stroke and they weren't responsive. And we started texting and calling everybody that we knew, and they started praying. And by the time that person who had had a stroke that was not responsive, that should not have been conversing, by the time they got to the hospital in Lafayette, they opened opened up the back of that ambulance and the person that had had the stroke and was unresponsive was talking to everybody and telling them I'm really okay I don't know what happened but I'm telling you oh I'm okay they took them in anyways and there was no sign of anything having been wrong because the church prayed so God still heals come on if he's just performed one miracle in the last 1500 years then he still heals. Number three, God uses the process. I said this last week, and it wasn't in this context, but I, I feel like it still fits. I said we should always pray like God can do anything. But we should stay and we should abide in Christ no matter what he does. Hey, hear me. The prayer of faith is not just believing that God is able to do something. Let's look at the scripture. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. Now, we're closing this series this week, and next week we're going to do a standalone on what and why we believe water baptism the way that we do. And then after that, we're going to go into a series on a book that you should read to your children before they go to bed at night called Revelation. It's a great book. We're going to go into that series. It is not, the prayer of faith is not you just praying and laying hands and prophesying and speaking in tongues and believing that God can and will perform the supernatural. It takes some faith. That's more the prayer of obedience. What is the prayer of faith? The prayer of faith is that you would stay committed to Jesus no matter how he answers what you just asked. That's the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is that you are praying and committing your concern to the one who can do whatever he wants to with it. That's the prayer of faith. And sometimes God uses the process more than he does the payoff. Are you with me today? The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will, the Lord will raise him up. This is not just a temporary healing. Because God could heal my daddy temporary and he would pass away from something else. But what God does is not just earthly and temporary. Come on, it's supernatural and it is eternal. And I know that one day, says the Lord, the lightning will flash from the east to the west like a thief in a night in the twinkling of an eye. And Paul said the dead in Christ, the body is going to 
arise first and we that remain shall follow thereafter because he is not just a God of this perishing body. He is a God of the body, the soul, and the spirit. So Paul says, therefore, I'm sorry, James says, therefore, verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Because only God can forgive your sin. But confiding one in another and praying one for another can heal you from the inside out. Guys, I don't know if you've noticed, but we need some healing in this country. Have you ever met a group of people who are more depressed and more anxious and more fearful and more fragile? I mean, it's almost like a joke these days. I heard a comedian the other day talking about this generation and, and this time. And like, you can't say anything to anybody anymore without them being like overly sensitive and offended and possibly suing you. I mean, we used to give people nicknames based on what happened to them. Like one eye. Come on, I had a friend in elementary school named Limp. I don't know his first name. You can't do that these days. Because we're soft. But the reason is we stop confiding in one another and we stop seeking to build God's kingdom and we start isolating ourselves and doing what we can to just build our kingdom. Well, I confided in somebody and they stabbed me in the back. I, I, I confessed to somebody and they prayed with me in front of me, but then they went and talked to everybody else about me. Listen, and I just don't trust any people anymore. I'm not asking you to trust people. I'm asking you to trust God and confide in people. I'm asking you not to get mad at your heavenly father because he's got a stupid kid. My children come to me, Daddy. What? Gabriel. Da, 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 and I was like, I know. Well, why am I getting in trouble? Well, because you decided to respond. To, yeah, but he. But whoa, 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 hang on. He is not your responsibility. He's my responsibility. This is not a question of whether you trust him. This is a question of whether you trust me. Why would you get mad at your daddy for something some ignorant child did? Or why would you get mad at every other sibling that you have just because you, one of your siblings is having a bad day? You don't burn the whole orchard, are you with me? You know, what if one of my children came to me and told me what one of the other children did? So I just don't want to have any more brothers and sisters ever again. Because of one bad moment? Look, I'm going to deal with that. The question is, do you trust me to deal with it? And God says, I told you to confide in one another. And pray for one another. Because you can be saved in a moment, but sometimes you are healed over time. And God uses the process. And sometimes, even though salvation takes place in an instant, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. It's not just that it worked. It's that it is working. Oh, we believe in salvation in an instant. We believe in the supernatural. We believe in the monumental moments. Come on, you remember the thief on the cross? One moment paying for his sin, the next moment walking in paradise. You remember the demoniac in the graveyard that met Jesus in a moment because 7,000 demons couldn't keep him from worshiping the king and he fell down at the feet of his savior and he was delivered from 7,000 in an instant and then it was likely that man that went and spread the gospel across the Decapolis and the 
book of Romans was written to a church that already existed even though Paul had never been there. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, we serve a God that can take a harlot who is possessed by seven demons and turn her into the world's first evangelist that lets all the other disciples know that he is who he said he is and he can do what he said he can do because Jesus is alive. That's instant. And we believe in the salvation that takes place in a moment. Come on, but we also believe in the sanctification that takes place over the mileage. It's not one or the other. It's both and. Come on, let's finish this thing. Number four, God cares most about my soul. This means, come on, this means... I got in trouble one day because I did that playfully and I upset somebody. I pay her. She can't get upset with me. <laughs> well, you pay her and I sign the check. Whatever. Number four. Number four. God cares most about my soul. Because I, I believe that. I think God really cares about you. My heavenly Father cares about you. The creator of the universe cares about you. How much do you matter to the creator of the universe? How much do you matter to my heavenly Father? He slayed his son on Calvary's cross so that he could have you. How much does my heavenly Father care about you and your situation? When Jesus cried out, Daddy, the Father ignored him because he wanted you. So the psalmist writes, Oh God, my soul longs for you, O oh Lord. I referenced this last week. You can go look it up. I, I believe it's verse 5 of James chapter 4. It's not in your notes. James writes, if this were not true, why would the scripture proclaim, hear me, that the Father yearns jealously over the Spirit that dwells in you? Did you catch that? The Father, He yearns jealously over the Spirit that dwells in you. Why? Because He decided to take a part of him and put it in you. And now there is a part of him inside of you that he only gets to receive from if you decide to let it, if you decide to give it to him. He subjected his ability to be fulfilled over whether we would or would not follow him no matter what. There's a part, it's, it's like my children. There's a part of me inside of them. It's like my spouse. This thing is covenanted and consummated. The two have become one. When, when she does something, it affects me. When I do something, it affects her. There's a part of me inside of her. And there's a part of us inside of them. And that is the picture of the Father and the Son. This thing was covenanted together and there's the Jesus shed blood and the blood of Jesus makes a, sounds a better word than the blood of Abel and the blood of Jesus is what covers us and God looks at us and the only way that he can have what he put in us is if we give it to him. So the Father yearns. He yearns for the Spirit that dwells in us. My soul cries out. This body is perishing. God cares most about what's inside of this body. Come on, I think if we just kind of look around, we can see God's not really interested in the body. Like the body of Christ, yeah, but the physical body... I mean, this thing just doesn't hold up very well. I heard somebody say last week he had dresser syndrome. I was like, dresser syndrome? 
He said, yeah, it's where my chest is going into my drawers. It's dresser syndrome. Well, this thing, like it or not, this thing's just falling. You know what I mean? I heard John Hagee say one time, he said, my knees buckle more than my pants do these days. That's funny right there. Thank God for suspenders. Come on, somebody. Just, I mean, it's silly, but like 35 plus and your back starts going out more than you do. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, oh, just wait. No, I know. It gets worse. I'm watching. You're welcome. This temple is temporary. Because there's a glorified one on the other side. When mortality will put on immortality. And that which is corruptible will put on incorruptible. Because God's ultimate answer to my prayer is eternity. God still heals, but God uses the process and he cares most about my soul. I got to preach this part and land this plane. Sometimes we get so focused on the promise and the payoff that we miss the process. And the payoff and the promise are normally tucked into the process. We are so in a hurry to get to heaven that we miss the people on the way. And hear me, it is a contradiction to say that you are saved and filled with the Spirit of God and not lead somebody into the presence of God. Elijah was so concerned about himself that he isolated himself and for a moment he missed out on what God had for him because he received one bad text message. Elijah on Mount Carmel, God rains down fire, consumes the altar. Pastor Weston referenced this not too long ago. One text message. I heard Pastor Samuel Rodriguez preach this message. He called it Jezebel's tweet. <laughs> he got one bad comment on his post. One email, one text message. Here's what the message said. Jezebel told Elijah, Woe be it unto me if you're not dead by the end of this day. May the gods deal with me even more severely. And that messed up Elijah's entire moment. I mean, he just saw the one true. It doesn't matter what the gods say. I ain't got time to preach that today. When the one true God has given you a word, you hang on to the word that the one true God said, no matter how many powers or principalities or people carrying them come up again. But Elijah heard the one word. He saw the one text message, and he ran, and he cried, and he isolated himself, and God came and ministered to him. And then he ran again, and he went into a cave. And the Bible says that God wasn't in the fire and God wasn't in the earthquake and God wasn't in the wind. But Elijah heard a whisper and he held on to the whisper and he followed the call of the whisper. And he found Elisha pushing a plow in a field. See, the devil was trying to distract Elijah because he knew that there was a double portion on the other side of what Elijah was supposed to do. And when the enemy tempted and when the enemy distracted Elijah, the enemy said, through a woman, by the way, and that same spirit does not hindered by male and female. In fact, they're crossing over right now. And that woman told Elijah, you're going to die by the end of this day or the gods are going to deal with me ever more severely. I came to tell the church today, it doesn't matter what the devil says to you when you know what God said about you. See, Elijah, Elijah went on from that place and raised up Elisha. And Elisha followed him through the end of his day. He followed him across Jericho. He followed him up the mountain. And Elisha watched Elijah never die. Come on, somebody. He went into the chariot. He was carried up into the heavens and Elijah showed back up on the Mount of Transfiguration. There he was with the Father and Moses and Jesus in the flesh. And we believe that Elijah will likely be one of the two witnesses that show back up in the book of Revelation. See, when you know who God called you to be, you don't need nobody else to tell you that God has already proclaimed over you. What the devil said to you is going to die 
die with his own words. Last time I checked, Jezebel's in hell. Last time I checked, Elijah's coming back with Jesus. So you stand in the face of the enemy and you proclaim, thus says the Lord. So I believe what he says over what I see. Verse 19, and I'm praying because my throat hurts. You remember that time throughout this book that James said, my brothers and sisters, and then he slapped us with something? This is how he closes his salutation to the church. Verse 19, my brothers, New Living Translation would say sisters. English Standard Version is sexist. It's a joke. It's not. It's not. It's understood. Watch what he says. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back. Verse 20, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now that's a miracle. See, I know that we cry out to God over politics and policies and people, but when is the last time that you just began to praise Him because He took your eternally separated soul and with the bridge of the blood of His Son restored you back to Himself? Because that's a miracle. Jesus said, don't fear the one that can destroy the body, but fear the one who can destroy the body and the soul in hell. Jesus told his disciples, you shouldn't be impressed that you have authority over devils. You know what's, and now listen, and I'm grateful, but I watch people celebrate the overturning of Roe versus Wade, which was a demonic decision that has cast our nation into all kinds of consequences. You can't kill people and get away with it. I don't have time to preach that. And that decision was overturned. And people that aren't even living for Jesus started acting like they won a battle. And I think Jesus is saying, don't be impressed. Like, praise God. We needed to pray for that. That needed to happen. Come on. If, if somebody has a devil in them and you cast out the devil, we need to be grateful that we are able in the name of Jesus to cast out the devil. But Jesus said, don't be impressed that you have authority over the devils and over demonic decisions. But be impressed that your name, that your name, is written in the heavens.